that was supposed to be seamless. Well, for many people, Mother's Day is a day to send your mother flowers or take her out to eat or even make breakfast in bed. It's a day to remember to say thank you for all of the invisible and vital tasks that mothers often do for their families without acknowledgement or even gratitude. So happy Mother's Day to all of you observing that tradition. On the other hand, Mother's Day can also be a very difficult day for those for whom this day represents loss, which might mean grief over a complicated mother-child relationship, or an absent mother-child relationship, grief over those things that never came to be, for some people, it is a reminder of mothers or children who are no longer with us. So it can be a bit complicated. But it turns out that the Bible is full of complicated stories. Indeed, today's Bible story is both an invitation to celebration and a parable about grief and loss. This Bible story actually has a title. It's known as The Ascension. And it comes right at the end of the season of Easter, when Jesus says goodbye. And in the Bible, we actually have two versions of this goodbye story. Both it comes after the disciples have had various kinds of resurrection experiences. And then one day, he is lifted up and carried away on the clouds. I know, uh, I think in the past I have compared it to uh, the movie Mary Poppins, you know, where at the end Mary's pre preparing to leave her charges, Jane and Michael Banks, having brought healing and joy into their dysfunctional family, and the, the family's off to go fly a kite, and uh, Mary rises into the air, the wind boys up her enormous black umbrella, and, and on the ground the chimney sweep Bert, Bert watches her sail up, up and away and winks at her and says, goodbye, Mary Poppins, don't stay gone too long. It's a story that works on film, but doesn't fit too well with our understandings of the ways that things work in real life. Such stories made sense in their day, perhaps, back when the world was flat. On a flat earth, it was easy to point to where God lived. God was up beyond the dome. In fact, God was partly the, partly the dome itself holding back the chaos that seemed too close in that early world. And so, in those days, when you have to explain the fact that Jesus is risen, but isn't really concretely visible that you can see him and prove it, it was easy to say, ah, Jesus went to be with God. He ascended. He went up. And also, the people who first heard that story had already heard a similar one about the prophet Elijah, who was said to have left his followers to go be with God in a similar way. But in 2024, when I can't even keep a microphone on my ear, what has happened to my ears in the past year, I ask you? Did they become something? I don't know. Sorry about that. So in 2024, though, it's not so easy to speak of the notion of ascension. Because now we know what we know about astronomy and space, to speak of Jesus ascending doesn't quite work. Gone up, where? Go, we're past the clouds, maybe? Or like to the space station? Is that far enough? A galaxy far, far away? A concept, as a concept, the physical ascension isn't really workable in this day and age. 
It's the stuff of science fiction movies, maybe, or fairy tales where imagination is more important than fact. But whether or not that story is factual, it doesn't matter so much as whether or not it has truth in it. And I confess to you that many is the time that I will pray looking up at the sky as if God is to be found up there somewhere. And I still need a way to understand what the disciples also needed to understand thousands of years ago. That Jesus as he was, first century, first century person's body, is not here today. But we speak of him as being resurrected. So then what? Well, we have this story of saying goodbye, of endings, of loss, and of grief. I think those who will spend today grieving the loss of their mother or the loss of a good relationship with their mother or their child might relate to the disciples who are having to say goodbye to their hopes and their dreams and their expectations as they disappear as if in a puff of smoke. Huh, smoke, we got that in the air today, don't we? And I don't know about you, but I can sure relate to the part where those disciples stood looking up into an empty sky. When your world is changed with a significant loss, you really don't know what comes next. You can feel directionless, stuck, without energy or will to do anything at all except stare after what has happened. And especially for the disciples who can't understand, can't wrap their minds around it, I think that's what loss often feels like. I can imagine, I mean, we can imagine it even today, right? Last night, people staring up into the sky to see northern lights, something we understand but we don't really understand. And the smoke, which we understand, but we don't really understand. These things that affect our lives change people's lives and we can do nothing but stand and stare up at them. Just like we do after a significant loss. I can certainly relate more to that than this version we have in the book of Luke where I don't know if you heard when she was reading, but this situation happens, Jesus disappears, and then they return to Jerusalem, and they were very happy. How is that possible? Especially since those two stories actually have very different timelines. In the book of Acts, this story comes 40 days after Easter, which is why we tell it at the end of our Easter season. Well, in Luke, it happens 24 hours after Easter. So the resurrection stories all happen in a very brief period of time, and then Jesus is gone. And then they're very happy. Well, would it surprise you to know that these ascension stories were actually told to provide comfort in the midst of grief? That they were not supposed to be stories about leaving, although leaving happens, but they were supposed to be stories about staying connected amongst the leaving. It's not the way we first read the story. It might help us to understand that the, in the book of Luke, for example, those stories were written down, well, told and then written down, just a short time after the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. So the center of their religious life had been torn down. Metaphorically, God had been defeated. And this story was told by Luke as a reminder that Jesus could not be contained in a building, that he was not limited to a physical place, that no building, no people, no book, or even religion could limit God's accessibility to others. 
while Jesus might not be seen, that didn't mean he was gone. Instead, he could be thought of as part of the world around us. That God's promises were now less about land and less about place, but a reminder that no matter what happened in your physical space, God was in fact not gone at all. In fact, the Celtic tradition notes that the Greek text that they were using before the whole Bible was translated into Latin had an interesting difference in the Luke story. It said, as he was blessing them, he withdrew from them. And the phrase, he was taken up into heaven, isn't there. So for Celtic Christians, Jesus didn't even leave. He did something called withdrawing. In the same way, you might be in a room at night, lit only by candles, you can imagine, and you might step out of the light into the shadows. Jesus was always understood to be in the room, unseen, but present. And today, whatever version of the story we read, we're invited to understand that whatever we might understand as heaven is more accessible to even us than we assume. I'm uh, reminded by, uh, about a, by a story, reminded of a story shared by Lutheran pastor Barbara Lundblad about the nurturing place. It's a daycare center in Jersey City in the States. And it was in a, featured in an article in the New York Times. And the center, run by Roman Catholic sisters, welcomed children whose families were homeless, families with no address. And so one day, the sisters took the children to the Jersey Shore. And these three and four-year-olds scrambled up the sandy dunes, falling and giggling their way to the top of what must have seemed like mountains to their little legs. And when they got to the top, they could hardly believe their eyes. Water as far as they had ever seen. More water than they could ever have imagined. And they slid down the dunes and ran to the ocean's edge and they chased in the waves that teased their toes and out, then they went and had lunch and after lunch they begged to go back to the dunes. And one little boy named Freddy outran the rest and he climbed his way to the top and he looked out and he turned to the others and shouted, it's still there. In Freddy's short life, so much had disappeared. Even something like the ocean could disappear over lunch. Well, we are older and wiser enough to know that the ocean is still there even when we are not looking. But we are not so sure about other things. With all of the changes we experience, we may feel a bit like the poet who said you discover that you live in a different place even though you've never moved. We are scrambling up those sandy dunes trying to find a place that will hold. This, I think, is the space in which the disciples found themselves. It's often a place where we may find ourselves trying to find a place that will hold. And the Ascension story is perhaps a kind of answer to those moments. Whether we are there because of loss, or grief, or uncertainty, or even family dysfunction. And that message of hope may come quickly, as in Luke. Or it may take some time, like for those in the book of Acts. But it is a story of maintaining connection through our losses. And so it's a story of comfort and encouragement to take that next step and that next step after that, trusting that you are not alone after all. And that if we focus our attention a little lower than the sky, we might discover how to do that. And we might see people who will help us do that. People who, rather than calling after Mary Poppins, who's up there somewhere, perhaps forever, are instead the voice of Freddy whispering in our ears, it's still there. 
in our complicated world, I start to understand why that made the disciples in Luke pretty happy. May God bless us with a sense of this kind of presence even now. Amen.